Welcome to Prepare Your Fertility. This is a specific skills workshop from Neurotraining. As uh, you are doing this as a part of this uh, pregnancy seminar group, of course it makes sense to have a workshop called Prepare Your Fertility. Obviously this is specifically for women and men who are with the women who want to make babies but can't. <coughs> or um, sometimes uh, I have people come to me and they say, oh look, I'm too old to have a baby. And they're, they're all of 34 years old. <laughs> what? Where was that woman? Uh, was she Russian? 52? Still having babies? Yeah, well, you know, some people just don't know when to stop. <laughs> um, so obviously some people don't need much preparation because they're fertile all the time for a long time. But this is a really, really good information for those people who want to become pregnant and who can't. Well, we need to have a little discussion about that situation before we get into the techniques because it's important to understand some things about the female psyche. The female psyche is very, very sensitive when it comes to the selection of the circumstances for creating babies. Very sensitive. So sensitive that that sensitivity can be the thing that's stopping her from having a baby. The sensitivity is not driven by what she's consciously thinking. It's driven by her subconscious knowledge of what's needed to make the best conditions to have a baby. And it's really, really strong. It's much stronger in women than in men, although I have discovered the same sensitivity in some men, and they know more about what's happening with their partner's body than, than she does. But that's an exception rather than the rule. So there are many reasons that, uh, that a woman may be using in her subconscious to not become pregnant. But there are actually just a few that it all comes down to. The main one, and this might surprise you or it might not, but the main one is her relationship with her partner. So many times I've had clients come and they say, oh look, I can't get pregnant. I can't get pregnant, I can't, we've tried everything, we've done the in vitro fertilization program, they've, caught, they've spent like $12,000 on this program trying to get pregnant and they're still not pregnant or what often happens is that they have lots of miscarriages, which is really more traumatic to the woman than if she's not getting pregnant in the first place. I mean, that's, that's really you know, a, a horrible thing for a woman to go through. So um, I have found that in balancing these people to their partners, one of two things happen. They get pregnant or they get another partner. <laughs> because if, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was married, a <laughs> long time ago, uh, my wife's girlfriend was putting on a party. So we went to the party and I just thought it was a party, but it was actually to raise money for the in vitro fertilization program that she was doing to become pregnant. And she had these little raffle tickets. So she'd give me a raffle ticket and say, oh, you know, you want to pay some money? I said, what's that for? And she told me and I said, no, I don't believe in that. And she, she got very defensive and said, why not? I said, well, be, there's lots of other ways that you can get pregnant that are a whole lot cheaper, a whole lot more effective and a whole lot faster. She said, oh, what? So I started talking to her about you know, neurotraining and what it could do and so on. And she said, stop, everybody, stop, turn the music down. I turn the music down. She said, Andrew's going to get me pregnant. <laughs> Ooh, that didn't go over well with the ex-wife. Well, she's ex-wife now, but it took about a month for her to settle down. <laughs> that, even after I explained, I was just talking about the techniques, you know, that's all. So um, I should have known then, but it was a bit dumb then. So in the uh, processes of these women going through the in vitro fertilization process, they spend a lot of money. They, they go through lots of unnecessary experiences. 
uh, they feel really bad because they're given hormone treatments and sometimes other sorts of treatments to try and get them pregnant and they will become pregnant and then often lose the pregnancy. Uh, and the justification for taking that approach is that, well, lots of women do get pregnant and give birth to normal, healthy babies. But there are lots of easier and better ways that should be attempted before the in vitro fertilization. And unfortunately, most women don't know of the easier ways. So that's one of the reasons why we have this workshop. There are another, another reason for women not becoming pregnant is there's a, there's a process that is called endometriosis. It's a dysfunction of the endometrium, the, the skin of the, the, um, the insides of the reproductive system of the ladies. And it's actually secondary to relationship stuff. But it can take its own life, it can become its own problem past a certain stage. And that has to be balanced, otherwise women have a very difficult time becoming pregnant. Getting back to their partner, one of the main reasons why they think their partner is not a good partner is because there's a, there's a part of our subconscious that measures the genetic, I guess, integrity of a person. How well is your genetics related to my genetics? Now, women pick this up much, much better than men, much, much faster. In fact, women know more about men than men know about men. And there's a lot of money being made on teaching men about women and men about men. <laughs> Simply because, you know, we as men don't function in the same way as women do. Uh, so as a consequence, women are much more sensitive to the genetic viability or the genetic compatibility between themselves and their partners. Now consciously, they may ignore that, but they ignore that at their own fertility peril because if they recognize that, and act on that, then they won't partner up with those people. But they do. So consciously they may suppress their awareness and they become partners with people that they actually believe at a subconscious level would not make a good father. And then they attempt to have children with these people. It's not going to work. Right? The woman's psyche is much stronger than the men's. And the woman's psyche is telling her this is the wrong guy, and it tells her by not allowing her to get pregnant. In fact, a lot of women actually do get pregnant, but they don't allow the pregnancy to continue, and they lose the, um, the fertilized eggs in the next period, the next menstrual cycle. So there's lots of interesting things that, that affect that process, and one of them really has to be the relationship the woman has with her partner. There has to be a lot of honesty and a lot of um, vulnerability shared between the two to get to a point of a common understanding of where each of the people are. Because in every case where a woman could not get pregnant, there's a gap in their communication. There's some part that they want to explain or to communicate to their partner and they can't do it. And that may be enough to trigger off their genetic suspicions and stop the fertility process. There are lots of things that can stop the fertility process in women. Electromagnetics, medications, stress. Uh, and that leads me to something that we've already covered in the Balancing Your Hormones workshop is the effect of the hormones. Now, having been through that workshop, you, you have direct influence on reorganizing the hormones from specific body reflexes. In this, and in combination with this, you have a remarkable ability to change the energetic state of the woman. The balancing your hormones changes the relationship and reorganizes the relationship between the different hormones and between the different glands. 
Right? That's much more a physiological or biochemical activity. But behind that again is another level of activity, particularly in the women, that is energetic. And when I was doing the research for this particular workshop, it became really obvious, even more obvious than I knew before, that the, the, the role of energy in women is crucial. It's absolutely almost the most important thing when it comes to her becoming pregnant. Women become energetically fertile six weeks before they actually conceive, or up to six weeks before. So if there are things going on energetically with the woman, constantly, you know, stress, um, taking medications, living in a very highly charged electromagnetic environment, all of those things can change her energy and not allow it to change to a point where she's now starting the fertility process. And that can be up to six weeks before she actually becomes pregnant or before the actual conception takes place. Six weeks before. Right. So um, there's a lot of preparation and that's why you know, I call this prepare your fertility because for women, that preparation is mandatory. Men don't need that. <laughs> in fact, most of them don't even want it. Right? They just want to get that sperm in there and get the job done. Right? Well, that's fine, but she's the one that does the choosing. Right? And it's her energetic state that's going to be conducive to conception or not. Now, that doesn't mean there's no responsibility on the the father's side or the partner's side, of course there is, and his responsibility is to create that environment. She wants the security of having that environment and knowing it's going to continue. Right? So, you know, the, the, the male involvement in this is one of security, because you know, the women have to have that sense of security. If they don't and they get pregnant, they become extra sensitive because everything becomes a threat, because they don't have the security. Where is the lack of security? It's in their energy. Their energy is not secure. It's not stable. That means that they can't go through different circumstances and feel like they're still themselves. Right? So they start to question everything. They question the pregnancy. They question themselves. They question their future. They question their past. They question their finances. They question the food. Everything becomes suspicious because energetically they're unstable. So it's actually their subconscious trying to tell them, hey, the suspicion isn't the problem. The suspicion is a symptom of your insecurity energetically in your body. Let's get that right. That's what this will do. This uh, will help the woman to stabilize energetically whatever is going on for her, and in a way that will help other systems to integrate better and she'll get that security that she wants. Okay. Uh, of course, the other thing is that you know, when she come, becomes secure and she realizes that her husband is actually another child, sometimes she won't tolerate that and she'll kick him out to go and find another mother because she wants to be one of her own. You know, she wants to have her own children, really, not just have another child. So when uh, women start to recognize that their husband is treating them like his mother, that can change her energetic state very quickly. She, she doesn't like that. She wants him to father her but she doesn't want to mother him. It doesn't work that way. And when it gets to pregnancy stuff, you'll see that that's very common in these women. And you'll actually see women who are playing the role of the husband trying to get pregnant. And it doesn't work. Because while she's playing the role of the husband, she's doing male dominant hormones. They're not conducive to fertilization. And if they are, if she does get pregnant, she probably won't hold the pregnancy for very long. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And these people are usually very highly accomplished. 
They're usually very intelligent. They know their job very well. And because of that, they sort of adopt the male role in society. That's unfortunate because that goes against their natural hormonal desire and chemistry to make babies. So a lot of these women you'll find that are infertile, you'll find that they have this, or you might find that they have this uh, part of them that's playing the father. Right? They're either trying to control their partner or they have a job that holds a lot of responsibility. Right? And their responsibility to their job becomes more important energetically than the pregnancy. So you want to look for that. You want to make sure that that's you know, reorganised and put back to its, its proper value structure because that can stop women from becoming pregnant pretty easily. The only other thing that I've seen consistent with women who, um, who can't get pregnant is a genetic problem. Actually, the sperm and the ovum don't match genetically. And these days, they, women are given an injection to try to uh, compensate for that, and that causes other problems. They will get pregnant, and the pregnancy will be fine. There won't be any autoimmune disease problems or anything. But in the mother, that's going to cause other problems, usually with their liver and kidneys, later on, you know, after the, uh, the baby's a little bit older. But that doesn't stop them from getting pregnant <coughs> um, unless they have, you know, if, unless they don't have the injections. If they have the injections and, you know, people go off and get the, their blood tested, the partners, and they can tell from the blood test whether the, the pregnancy is going to work out or not. And if not, the woman can have an injection of some certain types of proteins and then that literally turns off like an autoimmune reaction to the, um, to the fertilised egg and then the baby can be born. But again, if they have those injections, that's going to have to be um, balanced out later on. So in this, um, in this program, because this is working primarily on the energetic form of the woman, that most of the points in here relate to the meridian system. Now, if you don't know what the meridian system is, in traditional Chinese medicine, they have part of what they do is recognizing the flow of energy up and down the body through these different channels, or what we call meridians. And on these meridians are specific points of focus where energy can be manipulated. Now the Chinese, uh, they tend to be a little bit cruel, the Chinese, because they get little needles and they stick them into people. And that's called acupuncture. And they stick them in on these certain points on these meridians. And that can do some remarkable things. And we understand how that works and why that works but a lot of people don't recognise that you don't need a needle to do that. You don't need the needles to actually stimulate the response from these points. You can do just as effective and even sometimes more effective work by connecting these different points together in certain orders. And one of the things that I've discovered um, in doing the research for these workshops is that Often the more simplistic view is, oh, you have a liver dysfunction, fix the liver. And that sounds plausible, and a lot of people do that. A lot of modalities do that. But in fact, what really happens is the liver is dysfunctional because its relationship with this organ and this organ and this organ is not working properly. So if you balance the relationship between the liver and this organ and this organ and this organ, then the liver gets better, but it also functions better, and so do the other organs. You know, it's this disconnection between different functions that causes more problems than a lot of people realise. So what I've discovered is that there are certain orders of things. Now, obviously, this is not set in concrete. This can change. It varies depending on the person and the problem and what challenges they're having at the time. But what I've done is 
selected the most influential acupuncture points that relate to fertility and I've put them together into different recipes, different groups, different orders. Uh, so you'll see in different uh, parts of the manual, and we'll be going over this in more detail later on, that you have um, certain points that need to be um, utilised, rubbed in most cases, in a certain order. And you're given the order of these points in the lists. And an order, right, a certain uh, group of points, may relate to a particular type of dysfunction. That doesn't always hold true because, you know, you may not have that dysfunction, but that group of points could help you to rebalance very nicely. So that's just a guide. And if people are looking for a solution to their, you know, ovarian cysts, you know, they can go through the section that relates to ovarian cysts and rub the points in that order to rebalance what's going on with their ovaries. But you don't have to have cysts. For those, work, for those points rather, to work well. Right? You could have some other type of imbalance with your ovaries and those points would probably work just as effectively. So you've got to remember that these, these uh, recipes are not fixed in stone. Right? These are not the Ten Commandments. Right? These are guides. Right? And because a lot of people who are doing these workshops do not have muscle monitoring, then this is the best format to start with for most people. That means that you can get the benefit from these points without knowing muscle monitoring, go through these points in this order, and you're going to get a result. You can also experiment with changing the order. So, for example, in, um, in one of these, you, you start with a point, and then the next one, next one, next one, four points. So, you rub them in these points, and in this order rather, and you think, well, oh, don't really feel much different. Change the order of the first two. Just swap the first one around for the second one and do them in that order and see what happens. If nothing happens, go back to the original and take the third one and move it and do it in that order until you find the right order for you. Now, those of you who know how to do muscle monitoring, you can monitor for what the order should be straight away. That's, that's fine. But we've got to remember that most of the people who are looking at this, um, this uh, video don't have that ability yet. They will, but they don't have it yet. So starting off with these points in this order is a really great thing to do. There's a table in the, the um, manual. It's actually two pages. Uh, where it has the meridian name, it has the traditional point, either number or name, and it has another set of numbers on the outsides. Now I've listed these in the order of the, um, the points. So number one, this meridian and this point. Number two, same meridian, another point. Da -da -da -da. Now if you have a look at the recipes, you will see that it has two numbers. Each of these points has two numbers on it. There's where the points are. We'll be going over them shortly. Each number, sorry, each point rather, has two numbers. The first number in blue is the point that relates to the numbering of the point in that order. And you can go back to the chart and see what numbers they are and that will tell you what um, meridian and point number it is. The actual uh, point number itself from traditional Chinese medicine is the second number. So if you already know where these points are and what they are, then you can just pay attention to the second, um, the second numbering. So you have two ways of identifying them. You can identify them by the blue numbers, Right, which means you go back to the chart, you know, the, the actual illustrations, because they're also numbered here in the blues and in the traditional numbering system. Right, so you, if you want to, you can, you can learn where these points are just by looking at the pictures. We're going to go through these points so you know where they are 
right? So if you have any confusions or questions about them, we'll get that sorted out because you need to know where the points are, all right? Um, there are some special points that are what they call extraordinary points in the traditional Chinese system. Um, and I've broken these up into different sections and within each section there may be some general groups. Now that means if you don't have a specific issue that you know to look for, if you don't know you have you know, ovarian cysts for example, then you can do these general formats and one or more of them is going to help you. If you have a specific thing that you want to look at and it's listed here, then you would use the recipe specifically for that. Okay? So in the boxes right, are the general recipes. So if you don't know what's really going on, just do a general recipe. And in fact, um, uh, some people that I showed this to in Australia just used the general because that's all I'd done at that stage and it got rid of all sorts of things. I was really enthusiastic about it after I saw that happening. Um, so again, it's, if, you, if you don't know any specifics, just do the generals. You can see from the name of the different phases what they're relating to generally. Right. Now, again, if you don't know, even at the, the general phase name, that you have that issue or that might be a benefit, go through the first general of every section. Just do them all. There's really no harm in going through all the points. It's like, it's like if you were training for a marathon. You don't sit on your couch watching a television if you know you're going to be doing a marathon soon. Well, this is the same sort of training. Rubbing these points means that literally you're training your energy system to be prepared for something. Well, in this case, these are more related to preparing for fertility and subsequent pregnancy than other types. I mean, there's, uh, there's 365 regular acupuncture points and with the extraordinary points, I think there's something like 412 or something. So there's a lot of acupuncture points. And that's before we add the new acupuncture points from the, um, the University of Shanghai in, in China that have added another uh, 200 and something, 253 extra points. So that takes us up to like nearly 600 acupuncture points. Well, there's not 600 acupuncture points listed here. You don't need all of them to accomplish what, you know, to accomplish being fertile. But we do need some, if not all of these, to be stimulated to be able to be more fertile. Now this works for men as well as women, uh, because there is a section in the back, I think the last section uh, is relating to male fertility and different options there, you know, like where you know, there's a lack of sperm production, which is fairly common, actually. Um, and almost always, whether it's uh, male or female, there's also a need for nutritional support or nutritional change. Allergies plays a big role in this. You know, when a, uh, a woman has cravings, you know, she wants to have the pickles and the ice cream and the, the olives with the peanut butter on them and you know, strange things. She should not have what she craves for. It's absolutely the worst thing that you can do. The craving is an indication from the subconscious that the woman has a problem with that food. She has an allergy problem. And the allergies are actually trying to be told to the person by her subconscious, and that's what the cravings are about. She should not have what she craves for. People say, oh, you crave for it, you must need it, just go and have it. That will guarantee that the baby will have the same allergies. It's a guarantee. And so you see, so many times you see really big women 
feeding their really fat kids the same food that they have because the child was programmed to go for those foods in utero. The child has got very little hope of avoiding those foods because mum didn't pay attention or she wasn't educated properly about having those foods when she was pregnant. She craved them. She craved, craved fried chips. So she had lots of fried chips. And what happens is the baby now craves fried chips. It's an allergy response. Now those allergy responses are also going to influence hormone and energy balance. So sometimes you'll even find people who can't become fertile simply because of the food that they eat. It's actually not food. Right? Some of the stuff that people eat, it, you know, they say, well, if it doesn't kill me, it must be okay. Huh? Not. It's an energy. Think of this as an energy balance. You have a food that has very little, if any, energy in it. And you eat it. You use your energy to digest it. But because it's not highly you know, nutritious, what do we do? We turn it into fat and we store it somewhere. Most of the food that you eat gets turned into fat straight away. A very small percentage is actually absorbed and utilized in an energetic form. Most of it gets turned into fat and then gets reversed back again later on when you're starting to get a bit hungry or you're starting to do something. Well, in most people, that process of turning food to fat becomes a one-way process. It doesn't come the other way. And it's supposed to. The liver is supposed to get a hold of this fat and change it back into a usable energy source. Well, in a lot of people, that doesn't work. So if a woman who's pregnant has a craving for some food, she'll eat the food, have an allergy reaction to it, and immediately store that in her fat. What does she use to feed the baby with? Stored fat. A lot of women, a lot of people don't even realize that the baby gets fed energy from the fat the mother has stored. That's why she eats more and she puts on more weight. She puts on more fat to have the store to feed the baby. The baby is a purely nutritional consuming machine. That's all it does is consume nutrition. And so the mother not only will eat a lot more, but she really must eat right food. It's very important. It's really, really important. Um, Gotts and Birgit are going to have a baby soon. Yay! Um, and the, uh, the gynecologist is a little bit surprised at how strong this baby is. You know, like he's really fighting in there and he's really, he's ready to be born, like what, three weeks early or something? He's ready now, and he's, you know, like the, the projected time was what, the middle of next month. It's like he's, he's ready to go, and they can't work out how come. Well, gosh, neuro training does work. <laughs> Hello. So, you know, if you eat the right thing, you do the right balancing, you train the nervous system to help in the process, the baby is going to be born strong. It's going to be born a complete person. Even though it's still developing, there's not going to be any holes. But so many children are born these days with neurological holes in the system. And if you get enough holes, you've got autism. So, you know, the influence on the mother before pregnancy can be just as important as during and after. This is going to help the woman to get that stability before and during and after. You can still use all of these points, well not all of the points, some of these points during pregnancy you should not use. Just because in some cases where people were pregnant and they used these points, they had a spontaneous miscarriage. Right? And they're listed in there and I'll point them out to you as we go through. But that's only like two or three or four points. Right? All the rest of them can be used all through the process, before, during, and after. So, what else do we need to know about this structure? There's a section in here 
specifically devoted to endometriosis. And when we go through that process, we'll do that while holding the no endo in optic on the person. Now you can do this, men can do this process also, um, and it will work for their prostate. This is a really good procedure for the prostate gland in men. But the, the enoptic, no endo, is not going to help with this balance with men. <laughs> you can do it if you want, but it's probably a waste of time. Uh, what we will be producing in the future is an enoptic for the prostate gland for men that can be done in conjunction with this process. But we don't have that made yet. There's still some problems in what frequencies are going to be used. You'll see that in um, some of the enoptic packets, there are a different number of enoptic cards. That's because the frequencies that relate to, say for example, the depression set, there's five different cards in that. Right? And a person uses one card every day, so a, a different card every day. And over five days, they're influencing different aspects of their depression. Because the frequencies, if they were put together, would antidote each other. And we're having that sort of problem with the, uh, the prostate formula because some of the different frequencies that would challenge the prostate also antidote each other. So we have to select which ones can fit together and which ones not. So that's why we've had a bit of a hold up with that one. But if we do the, the endometriosis procedure in men, it will help with the prostate. In fact, there was uh, one guy in, uh, in Australia who had just been diagnosed as having cancer of the prostate and he wanted his cancer removed and I said look you know I don't work on cancer it, you know don't you that it's not legal to work on cancer right unless you're you know qualified to do that it's not legal to work on cancer so you never tell a person that you're working on their cancer but work on the person absolutely because you know if we're training their nervous system but you're not training the cancer Right? You're training the person. So I told him, look, you know, I, I don't work on that stuff. You know, I'll, I'll help your prostate to function better, but I'm not, you know, I'm not here to get rid of the cancer. He said, oh, well, okay. Well, let's, let's get the prostate working better, and then, you know, if I have to have the operation, it'll be able to recuperate. I said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I took him through this process, and uh, with some, you know, specific different frequencies and so on, and three weeks later, he went off and had a check. It was actually a preparation for the operation, and they couldn't find the cancer. He said, that's strange. It was there a couple of weeks ago. I wonder what happened to it. <laughs> and they did another check and another check and another check. They couldn't believe that it was gone. And they said, what have you been doing? He said, oh, I just did a bit of neurotraining, and that's about it. I said, what's that? Right. So now we had a, have a, a radiologist who wants to know about neurotraining because he was the guy taking the x-rays and finding that it, it was there three weeks ago and it's gone now and he wanted to know why. So he's uh, investigating what neurotraining is about now. But I was not working on the cancer and I told him straight out, I'm not working on the cancer. But we did do this process for his prostate and his prostate got so much better, he did the rest. Fantastic. You know, great. Now, we, I don't know if that's going to work the same with everybody that has prostate cancer. And certainly, I would not say that it will. Because we're not working on the cancer. We're working on the person and helping to train their nervous system to help their prostate to work better. So for the, for the men, this process works really well for prostates. For the women, you can do this process and include the no endo. Even if you don't have endometriosis, and in fact, most women at some stage in their life will have endometriosis. You do naturally at the time of, at certain times of your cycle. You have the same situation that where it stays, it's called endometriosis. But it's part of your cycle. Right? Every woman has endometriosis at certain times. But it's supposed to go away. If it doesn't go away, then there's some problem maintaining it. And this will help to remove that and, and take that problem out of the way. 
So uh, that was a, a point for the endometriosis for men. It doesn't mean you have endometriosis, uh, but you can always use this to improve the function of your prostate. Okay. All right, what time have we got? Oh, we've still got lots of time. Good. Now, what I want you to do then is to turn to your diagrams. Starting page 12. Now, the, the numbering on these diagrams, uh, the, the position of the points on the body do not follow the numbering in the table. So this isn't one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No, it doesn't work that way. But what we do need to do is become familiar where, of where these points are. All right, so we're going to start the process of going through the position of the points first. Because if you only learn that in the workshop, when you go home, you can look at the recipes and you'll know where to go to for the points. And that's more important for me and for you in the workshop at the moment to know where these points are. That's really important because, you know, I could give you the recipes, but if you don't know where the points are, you go, oh, it's too hard, close the book, and you'll never use it. That's no good. So we have the, these are the illustrations, the same as what you have in the book, except that these are just on one big page. You should see the book that comes with this. It's huge. Um, <clears throat> so we'll just pull out my little windows to the world. I think one of the, the next specific skills workshop is going to be on vision. Mm -hmm. It's good we need to add that to the list. <clears throat> right. So, oh look, we've got one, two and three. How about that? After having said they don't follow the numbering, but there you go. So, <clears throat> uh, you can uh, actually, you want to come out and I'll, I'll illustrate these on Estefania because uh, she has bigger acupuncture points than I do. <laughs> okay, uh, just to the one side. Right, now if you look at this first one, number one is CV, which is the central vessel meridian, central meridian, 15. So if you go to the xiphoid process right, and just one finger down, xiphoid process, and just one finger down, straight down the middle. Where's the xiphoid? There, good, right, in the middle. And give that point a rub. You'll rub all of these points. All of these are rubbing points. Now, depending on what is going on with the energy of the points, some of these points will be under energy, some will be over, and that's why you do all the points in this order, because the effect is to actually bring up the low energy and bring down the excess energy. Now, as I said before, if you know how to do muscle monitoring, you, you, know, you can do this with uh, people and find out which order, because that's what the order will be doing. will be bringing up the low energy and bringing down the high energy. So eventually all of the connections between those points will be working on the same level of energy. The other effect, because with acupuncture points you have three types of problems. A deficiency, an excess with the magic finger, and a disturbance, right? a disturbed energy. Right? It's like what they call perverse qi in the Chinese way of thinking. So with the deficiency you bring the energy up, that's not a problem anymore. With the excess one, you bring the energy down, that's not a problem anymore. But the effect of doing that actually helps to reorganize and push out the perverse G. So it's not a surprise that after having done any of these recipes, that people can have a detoxification type process. And many students who have you know, done these courses have said that if they just drink pure water, like a few days after doing the workshop, it helps them to you know, clean out well. So <clears throat> the, um, uh, the first one is 
there's CV15. If you go another body inch down, a body inch in Chinese medicine is the, the length from the knuckle to the tip of your thumb or two fingers. So if you go from the xiphoid and then you go down four fingers, right, you'll come to this point. Sorry, three fingers. Let me think, I've got to remember my Chinese. Yeah, three fingers down, you'll get to the next point, which is CV14. CV13, um, the next one along, is a dehydration point. It's not listed on the chart, but if you want to you know, note that, it's really helpful. We'll be doing, during pregnancy, we're doing a lot of work on water, water metabolism, and we'll be using that point in that workshop. So, you know, if you want to write that down on your notes, you're welcome to do that. Now, if you go exactly halfway between your belly button and the xiphoid process, you have CV12. All right, so halfway, belly button, xiphoid. All right, now, this relates to, this is like a warning point for stomach imbalances, but it has a lot to do with reorganizing blood factors and particularly how the emotions are influencing the blood and how emotions are influencing the digestive process. So that's right between, that's halfway between the belly button and the xiphoid process. Okay? <clears throat> Just to finish off this chart, I want to show you uh, the liver 14 point here. Now, the illustration looks like it's right up close under the breast, but it's not really because female breasts tend to go a bit further than the anatomical positions. So where the breast actually touches the chest, and that if you go down one rib, right, but in line with the nipple, right, um, so if uh, Stephania, yeah, actually... Probably, it's probably true that where the female breast comes, if you don't have really large anatomy, um, <clears throat> that, that point is probably actually in the right position. But anatomically, from where the breast actually meets the chest and you go down one rib in line with the nipples, that's where the liver meridian ends. Now the end points of the meridians tend to stimulate the energy for the whole meridians. So uh, because you're rubbing the end of the meridian here, this will tend to stimulate all of the liver meridian energy. It's a very important point for detoxification and for reorganizing the biochemistry that's needed to maintain or to set up the hormones that will allow the, the woman to become pregnant. You remember that when we talked about hormones in the other workshop, and sometimes the liver doesn't break down the hormones properly. Well, this is one of the points that will help the liver to reassess what it's doing with the hormones. And that's why this point, liver 14, the end of the meridian, is such an important point with fertility. Because if you've got too much of a certain type or certain types of hormones being put back into the bloodstream, then you may not be able to develop the hormones needed to conceive well. And so liver 14 is a really good point for helping to balance that out. Okay. Let's go down while well, we've got the front active. Either side of the belly button, just one inch either side, one body inch either side, is stomach, um, oh, kidney, kidney 20. All right. So just a little bit out of either side of the belly button is kidney 20 point. Sorry, kidney 16, it's number 20, it's kidney 16, either side there. This is also, uh, if you go out uh, a little bit more, you have the alarm point for the large intestine. It's not out that far. It's just one finger width either side of the belly button, it's on the kidney meridian. The stomach meridian is the next one over. This is close to the to the navel. Okay? Um, this is really, really important for 
Well, there's, there's a few points, and I'll discuss their relevance in a minute, but the, in combination with some of these other points down here is really important for the balancing of the genetics, like making sure that the genetic progression through the developing fetus is regulated properly. That's all done by the kidneys. In traditional Chinese medicine, the kidney meridian is called the genetic meridian, or the inheritance meridian. Now there's another thing that we'll be having a look at, but we'll look at that a little bit later, is what you do to make sure that this balancing also includes any inherited imbalances. There's a very simple way of being able to do that. But from a meridian point of view, these kidney points here, kidney 16, and there's a couple of points you can see just down there by the, by the ends of the pubic bone. Right, they're actually a little bit wider than the ends of the pubic bone, is stomach 30. Stomach 30 and kidney 16s are really quite remarkable at handling the genetic patterns, that is the inherited patterns that influence how the developing um, fetus is, um, is continued. There are some other points. Number 55 over here is called Zigong. Zigong. Um, it's not only a measurement point for the function of the reproductive organs, but rubbing this point will stimulate the integration of the reproductive organs with the kidneys. So it also has some related effect to genetics. Anything related to kidneys is also going to bring in anything that may be associated genetically or via inheritance. So you have the kidney 16, you have the zigong and stomach 30. Those points are really quite amazing if there are reproductive organ imbalances. And particularly if those imbalances come from an inherited point of view. So rubbing either side of your belly button, all right? Not too far out, yeah, that's good is kidney 16s. Now, if you go straight out and down another finger width, if you go out to the side and down a little bit, you have some gallbladder points, gallbladder 26 over here. The gallbladder 26 is part of what they call the belt meridian. There's a meridian that goes around your body. All right. It's this meridian that actually feeds the energy to the uterus. I'll tell you that again because this is involved in miscarriages. When a woman is pregnant and she can't hold the pregnancy, it's usually because there's a lack of energy in the uterus. The reaction is that the uterus becomes more sensitive and will contract faster. We think a lack of energy means, oh, I can't do anything. No, a lack of energy means that it becomes more sensitive because it doesn't have enough energy, and what energy it does have, it puts into contraction to try and protect itself. That doesn't help when you have a little baby in there or, or you know, a, a um, fertilized egg because it'll push it out. So the, uh, the belt meridian right, is a part of the... Uh, meridian that goes around the person. It's the only meridian that, that, well, that's not true. There are other meridians that go around, but it's the primary one that goes around and it attaches internally to the uterus in women and to the prostate in men. The uterus and the prostate are the same thing except in a different shape. So the prostates are in men, the uterus is in a woman, but the energy patterns that run them are exactly the same. Right. And it's actually very interesting that where you have you know, husband and wife, he has a prostate problem, she will have a uterine problem. Every time. If he has a cancer of the prostate, she has a deficiency of energy in the uterus they're almost always not having enough sex because she doesn't feel like it. 
Well, then he becomes excessive in his energy. She's deficient, but is still represented in the same pattern. He ends up with problems with the prostate because she's deficient in the uterus. So you have to balance both of them. And accidentally, they end up having a better sex life. Huh. Who would imagine that? So there you go. <clears throat> All right. So um, if we continue down the middle then, we go down another couple of finger width to um, CV6. Right, just a couple of fingers down from the belly button. So what are we doing? Three fingers down is CV6. If you come up from the pubic bone, you've got CV3. Just a couple of fingers up from the pubic bone is three. Right? And between six and three is four. It's not exactly half. It's a little bit lower than half. So if you have a look... You've got a couple of fingers width down is CV6. A couple of fingers up from the pubic bone is CV3. So just a little bit below half is CV4. And so three and four are much more lower down in the, um, uh, in the abdomen, you know, just up from the pubic bone and a bit up from that. And then CV6 higher up. Um, then you have this funny little point, stomach 29. So you go to the end of the pubic bone and a couple of fingers out and a little bit up is stomach 29. Now if you're not sure where these are, just rub the area. You're going to be stimulating the point anyway, so that's fine. You don't have to, you don't, unless you're putting needles in, <laughs> You don't have to know exactly where the points are. You can just sort of, in fact, some people just rub the whole area. Oh, gee, oh, gosh. And you see women doing this. I've seen them. They come in and they've got this big fat tummy and they're going, oh. They're stimulating all of these acupuncture points down here that support their pregnancy. They're doing it naturally. Mm -hmm. So if they do this to, you know, before they get pregnant, right, you can rub all these points here and all these points across and you're going to get the same effect. All right. Just keep rubbing them. Now obviously, you know, if you can identify where these points are a bit more specifically and they're sore, you know to keep rubbing until that soreness goes away. Sometimes even tapping the point initially and then rubbing it will help the soreness to go away. The soreness or the pain in any of these acupuncture points is what they call excess energy. There's too much energy in the point, and that's what makes the pain. So often rubbing disperses it, and if it doesn't, tapping will disperse the excess energy and the pain will disappear. Tapping isn't always a great idea because you don't know where the energy is going to. And you could be creating another excess energy somewhere else. But rubbing the points will tend to bring the brain's attention to the point and it will organise where the energy has to go to. It's actually a lot more efficient to rub a meridian point than to tap it. You may have heard of some processes that use point tapping as their main way of fixing problems. And even though the symptoms definitely change, the consequences are unknown. It's really not a good idea to do that unless you know muscle monitoring and can monitor the process and know exactly what's going on in the person. I highly recommend you don't do point tapping unless you have the ability to muscle monitor the effects of it. Because otherwise you can be creating other problems that are going to show up in 10 years later. But they're still there. But with the muscle monitoring, you can find those straight away. So uh, the way to overcome that is to use rubbing. Rub the points. Because the rubbing has a different physiological effect and a different physiological response in the person. It's much, much safer to rub the points then. All right. Now, obviously, when you're following your recipe, you might be doing one up here and one over here and one over here. You just have to become familiar with, with where the points are. 
Now, most of you here, I would imagine, know at least something about the meridians and where these points are. But for those of you looking at this DVD for the first time and don't know anything about meridian points, then become familiar with where the points are so that you can go to the, the recipes and know sort of generally where that point is. It's a good idea to get a little book on acupuncture and just see where the meridians run and where the points are because that can help to you know, give you a better understanding as well. Okay, do we cover all the points there? Da -da -da -da. Stomach 29 is just up, so we've got stomach 30 is a couple of inches out from the pubic bone and up a little bit. Then if you just come up a bit more, another finger width up, you've got stomach 29. Now these uh, stomach 29 points are not often used, but when they are needed, they're very necessary. So these are not uh, a couple of points that you'll find listed a lot in the traditional Chinese medicine books. But um, when a person does need this point stimulated, they need it a lot. And so that's why it's on the list, because it is in some of the recipes. So uh, um, if you're comparing these recipes with, with other traditional ways of using acupuncture points, you'll see that some of the points here are very different than the points that uh, you'll find in other books. That's because these work. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we'll leave it at that and we'll, um, we'll go to a break. The, um, the points are really not difficult to know and if you're not sure, rub the area. It's not going to be a problem if you're rubbing, if you need this point but you're rubbing the whole area, you might be getting other acupuncture points. That's okay, that's fine, but so long as you're rubbing the one that you need in the process, then you'll get the same effect eventually because you're following a recipe. So you might go from here to here, somewhere on the foot, somewhere on the hand, for example, then up to the head, and then, oh, great. Now the brain gets the idea to connect those areas together and you'll get the effect that you need. You don't have to be an expert acupuncturist for this to work. You can do this very generally and it still works. Good, <clears throat> let's jump across now to the back points. Now here you'll see that there's a couple of uh, gallbladder points, but all the rest is on the bladder meridian. Now the bladder meridian actually breaks up into two different sections. It has a section that runs through the middle and a section that runs more on the outside. So the middle sections are all of these inner points here. Uh, the outer section are these points up here, the top ones uh, and these outer ones down here. We have a couple of gallbladder points at the top and all of these have to do with reproductive function in one form or another. So <clears throat> if uh, Estefania turns around, let's turn around on, good. All right, if you just come to the middle of the, the shoulder, all right, and you just come back to halfway, we have the gallbladder point. Now the gallbladder point is just a little bit back. It's not right on the middle of the muscle. It's just a little bit back in there. Now sometimes if you push on these, uh, these points, they can feel very tender. The, the point here, although it's a gallbladder point, is very much related to kidney because the upper trapezius muscle is a kidney muscle. And you'll find that any of the points, any acupuncture points that live on a muscle will have some relationship to the organ that the muscle relates to, for those of you who do a more advanced stuff. All right, so there's your gallbladder point. This can be uh, involved in a detoxification process for the kidney and the gallbladder. Great. So <clears throat> now the, the bladder meridian runs down the center of the back like this, and it also splits and runs more wide either side. We're not gonna use all the points on the bladder meridian because we don't need to, 
But as you can see from your illustration on page 13, that the um, bladder 42 point, which is just, just outside of the tip of the scapula, here's the scapula bone here, just on the tip of there, just above that, is bladder 42. Right? And it's, it's, it's almost touching the bone. It's not quite, but it's, it's almost touching the bone. This has a lot to do with the, the emotions and the attitudes related to pregnancy or to anything. So if the person is having problems with you know, some sort of attitudinal um, imbalances, these points help to wake up the brain to pay attention to those attitudes. Moods sometimes as well, but emotions and attitudes are located in this point. If you come down from that a couple of fingers, you have the bladder uh, 44 points, and right next to that inside, you have the um, bladder 15 points. All right in here and out for the bladder 44s. If you come into bladder 15 go down a couple more points, you've got bladder 17. Then if you divide from the sacrum to the base of the ribs in half, then you have the bladder uh, 23 points either side of the spine. So you've got the sacrum, the ribs, halfway. We'll just pull that down a bit. There we go. Sacrum, ribs, halfway down. Right, right across here, you have a lot of points that relate to fertility. Right. You have the middle point, which you can see is governing four. Right. You've got the base of the sacrum is here. You come up, uh, what is that, two vertebra. You've got governing four in there. You've got two points outside of that, a bladder 23, and two points outside of that, bladder 52. So that whole area across there, you'll see women rubbing. And this happens too when they're pregnant. Right? They'll go, oh, and they'll rub their back. Right? And they're, they're stimulating this whole area right across. It's very important. And when the, when the woman feels like, she, she'll say to you, oh, it feels like my back is going to break. Right? It feels like if I step too hard or do something, it's going to break in half. Well, that's because often the, um, the energy gets stuck right across here right? and it's a very good thing to rub here in, you don't have to be trying to get pregnant for this either but this represents a blockage of energy between the top half and the bottom half that doesn't help when you're trying to get pregnant or for that matter other things if the energy gets blocked across here then there's lots of problems in that communication between the top and the bottom this also relates to the belt meridian. It's not a part of the belt meridian. The belt meridian actually runs a bit higher. It goes around, the one that feeds the uterus. But this is where the energy gets blocked to the belt meridian. So it doesn't get into the energy cycle that's going to take the energy into the uterus. So even if the woman doesn't seem to have anything physiologically wrong, the energy may not be getting there because it's blocked across the back here. It's really, it's just a nice thing to do. If you do this now, just rub across the back there. It's very pleasant to do. It's very reassuring. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the, the load, a lot of the responsibility that a woman will take, she feels on the shoulders and the gallbladder points will become sore, but it gets blocked down here. So as you can see, Stephanie are rubbing the, the area, right? That, just that within itself, can give the woman enough security to go and continue with the um, fertility process. Uh, usually when this part of the back is tense, because the person thinks, they may not actually be, but they think that their job at hand is too big for them. So everything is, oh, it's too heavy, oh, I can't handle this, it feels like my back is going to break. And they will say that, you know, as soon as they say that, you know to go back and rub these points. 
Uh, there are also homeopathic preparations that help with that. There are exercises, there are specific muscle points and so on. But from a pregnancy point of view, if these points are out of balance, the energy isn't s circulating properly and so there's very little hope of the pregnancy happening. Then the remaining points are sacrum points, bladder 31, 33, 26 and 28. And these are all points on the, the inside edge of the sacrum. So the sacrum base, what they call the base is here, and it comes down in a point like this. So the points that, that we're talking about here run in this area here. So you can just rub the whole area to get these points stimulated. If you know where they are, you can stimulate them specifically, right? and they're on both sides. There's four points on both sides. Right? And just doing this, just as Stephanie is showing you, rubbing these points and rubbing across the back just relaxes the whole of the lower back area. It's a really nice thing to do. If you've been working hard, you're feeling a bit tense, and particularly if you haven't been able to move around, you can do this, and this will give you the same as about you know, 10, 15 minutes of walking in terms of exercise. So if you do this on a regular basis, three or four times a day, it's the equivalent of going for about an hour's walk. So it's a really nice thing to do energetically. You know? Plus, it opens up the, the energy to flow from the sacrum, because a lot of the, the sacrum nerves are connected to the reproductive organs. So it opens up the energy for the nerve system to control the reproductive organs much better. Okay, great, good, thanks Tom. All right, you can turn around, thanks to viewers. All right, so now <clears throat> if we go to the, um, the next page in your book, on page 15, right, we're having a look at this um, face and ear page. <clears throat> There are some very, very interesting points here and a lot of people would not expect that to be able to get pregnant, you should rub points on your head. <laughs> but it's true, you can. The, uh, at the top of the head, if you go from the, uh, just face me, if you go from the, the ear hole straight up to the top of the head, you have GV20, governing vessel 20. This is a control point for the whole of the nervous system. There's, this point is what they call the meeting point of a thousand meeting points. Now I've read different texts that refer to this point as the meeting point of a hundred meeting points, the meeting point of a, of a thousand, of ten thousand and of a million. <laughs> we don't have a million points, but you know, the, you know these things get a little bit exaggerated in some translations, but um, this actually controls 100 other acupuncture points. And so in most of the text, you'll see the referral here to this as the meeting point of 100 points, because it actually controls the function of 100 other things in your body. And you can use this to wake up your brain's attention to what else is going on in your body. So Stephanie can just hold up there, just give it a rub. If you're not sure where it is, just follow your ear up and it's right in line with your ear hole. Poink. And just give it a good rub. It's in the midline, right? So rubbing, 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 rubbing. It's a good thing to do if you're mentally tired or you feel like gravity is winning. Gravity's pulling you down. Things are getting really heavy. Oh gosh and you finish the day three feet shorter than you started. <laughs> well, this is a point that's an anti-gravity point. Right? Rubbing these points, or this point, will have to lift you up. One of, the, uh, one of the points you can use during pregnancy is where the woman feels like it's really pulling down, because it is, <laughs> but she really feels like it is. Rubbing this point will actually help her to tighten all her ligaments and pull it up. It's quite a good one. On the ear, you have two really important areas. One is the triangular fossa, which is this triangular little piece up here in the corner of the ear. And Stephanie can get in there and just rub the area, 
right? We can all do that. Just get in there and rub the area. Because this is, for most people, this is generally an energy lift area. Male or female, just get in there and rub the top corner of your ear. And this will raise your energy, generally. Another one which is more specific to the reproductive organs is right inside what they call the intertragic notch. Um, so if you go to just where the, the ear cuts down in here, straight in there, just straight in at the bottom of the ear. <laughs> right? And give that a rub. Now that will put the energy, or more specifically related to energy of the lower part of your body and particularly the reproductive system. But it's the whole area. There's, you're actually stimulating a lot of different uh, ear points with these areas, but you're using the whole area. Right? Very, very good for general, the top one for general energy and the bottom one for more sexual energy. Right? So if you're feeling a little bit low in the libido, just say, hang on, I just have to do some warming up <laughs> and rub your ears then they'll know you're crazy <laughs> okay so they're really important those points and you'll see them listed in some of the recipes because they're a mandatory part of those processes on the front of the face we have a couple more of the uh, bladder meridian points plus two three of the extraordinary points and the bladder points are here, turn face to viewers. The, the bladder points that we're playing with are bladder two, just on the end of the eyebrows. So if you want to give them a rub. For those of you who know where these meridians live, bladder one is actually right inside next to the canthus in the eye. But you don't actually need to rub that point. You can actually rub bladder two and actually get a better effect. Bladder 2 is connected to how we regulate muscle tension. So where there's a lot of muscle tension anywhere in the back that may be blocking the person's energy flow, these points will help to open up that energy flow and reset the muscle tension, particularly with back problems. Mm -hmm. Now, if a person is stiff, right, they just, their back is really stiff, you can rub these points and just have them bend forward, do a bit of rotation, sideways stuff, you know, and it will reset the muscles so that they can maintain their flexibility again. Very nice points. Good. So in the middle, right in the middle of those points, is another point called yin teng. I didn't name these. These are a Chinese invention. You know. <coughs> Right, rubbing this point here. Yin Tang relates primarily to your limbic system. But it does a lot of things. It does a lot of things. It has to do primarily with resetting value responses. It's a value reset point. So if the if the woman is uh, thinking she wants to get pregnant, but at the same time she hates her husband, then yin tang is going to be a really good place to start <laughs> and will be involved somewhere in the process because it helps her to re-evaluate things, people, processes, circumstances, all sorts of stuff. Great, good. Another of the uh, extraordinary points is this one called Ipeng. Ipeng is, um, if, you, if you go straight up from the eye, straight up from the eye and one finger width across. Right? It's an area right, on both sides of the head. You want to rub there. That's specifically putting energy into the reproductive system and the ability to conceive. This is a specific conception point. I've had women only rub these points and they've been able to conceive. We've had people rubbing these points alone, no other points, 
and they were able then to become pregnant. So these are very special and very specific to reproductive organ function. The e ping points. Great, good. Then we have Tai Yang. Tai Yang is right in the middle of the temple area. Right? And you know yourself, when you get stressed, you go, oh, mm. and you're actually rubbing this point because it's a rebalancing point between the left and the right sides of your body. Now, this becomes important when a woman is trying to conceive, particularly if she's doing male role stuff, because she's doing one side only and not the other. And you need both sides to have a, um, a balanced fertility. So rubbing both sides at the same time helps the energy to balance left and right, and eventually, with rubbing GV20, it will then balance top to bottom. So everything gets nicely balanced. And quite often that's enough to you know, allow the woman to become fertile. So on the face you have um, those three extraordinary points. You have the bladder points. And on the top you have GV20. In the ears you have the triangular fossa and the intertragic notch. Very, very important points for pregnancy. For other things too, you know, a lot of these points and working on these points for lower back pain works very well. You know, where people come in, they've got lower back pain and there doesn't seem to be anything wrong. You know, the doctor says everything's fine, the chiropractor's done all these adjustments and everything and they still have pain. Then you want to think about these points because all of these will regulate what's happening in the lower part of your body and hence their relationship to becoming fertile. Okay.